our future actions as we indeed seek justice and peace for all. We begin, as always, with a brief recap of last week's class, where we looked at voter suppression then and now, and of course, as we're seeing into the future. We began with the legal history of voting rights in our country way back to the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution and its amendments, and then various legislative actions and pivotal Supreme Court decisions. We discussed the 15th Amendment, resistance to its implementation, the end of Reconstruction, that was followed by 100 years of voter suppression tactics applied against African Americans that finally resulted in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which offered us a glimpse of how voting was intended to operate in providing the consent of the governed to our leaders. But then came the Supreme Court decision in 2013 of Shelby v. Holder that gutted this landmark legislation and led to the introduction of hundreds of voter ID laws, voting roll purges, limitation of resources provided to minority voting precincts. And the stories went on and on. And then as a consequence of the 2020 elections, the assault is accelerating. The class series overall began with the early years from 1619 to the end of the Civil War, and then a time we called slavery by another name, Reconstruction, the passage of black code laws and the convict leasing that resulted, Jim Crow laws and the significant almost total segregation of our population enforced by horrific violence. Then we moved to the 20th century and looked at public policy, such as the Federal Housing Administration, Social Security, the GI Bill, and then the pivotal civil rights movement. Moving on from that time period, the backlash that resulted with the war on drugs and mass incarceration that began in the 1970s and continues to this day and voter suppression then and now. And today we turn to where do we go from here? I wanna start with a couple of definitions. Prejudice is an unfavorable opinion or feeling that is formed beforehand or without personal knowledge, thought, or reason. And so as we look at the, one of the consequences of the near total segregation in our society, in our history, and its legacy today, there is so much personal knowledge that we don't have of one another. And as a consequence, stereotypes fill the void. The term white supremacy, when we hear it, we we'll often hear it in the context of white supremacists those armed, angry, violent, hateful people. But white supremacy is actually a theory or a doctrine or a belief that white people are inherently superior to people from all other racial groups, especially black people, and are therefore rightfully the dominant group in any society. And much of that belief lurks within us and underlies many of our un unspoken, unconscious feelings and attitudes. Racism itself is prejudice, discrimination, particularly, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that's minority or marginalized. And importantly, in the sense of racism, as an entity, it is a system of prejudice plus the power to make real all of that discrimination. And so when people say, well, you know, black people are racist too, not really. They may be prejudiced 
um, they may be biased. They may seek in some small way to discriminate against white people, but there is no system that enforces their prejudice. Um, and so racism belongs to us, to white power. So our topic today is where do we go from here? And I have some things to say and I, I expect you do too. And so we'll leave time for that uh, at the end. The question is, uh, what have we learned during this six weeks? And perhaps by other readings or discussions that have occurred in between our class sessions. Knowing what we know now, how are we affected by it all? How are we different? What is it that we see differently than we did before? And ultimately, action is what is important. So what do we need to do individually and collectively based on what we now know? And do we indeed feel any new sense of urgency to act given the magnitude of the issues we've discussed? So what we've learned, slavery created and sustained an underclass of people before the United States and after it was formed. And that institution necessitated a belief in black inferiority because how would you treat people, functioning, intelligent, capable human beings the way that slaves were treated? The process of segregation, the separation by law until 1964, separate but equal from the Plessy v. Ferguson decision, perpetuated white supremacy because we know that it was separate indeed, but equal, not so much. And whenever the two circumstances were unequal, it was never the black side of the equation that was more favorable. All of this was further instituted by intentional public policy that systematically disadvantaged black people in housing, in education, benefits, jobs, the criminal justice system, voting across our society. And so the roots of today's inequality are deeply embedded in who we are as a country. How are we affected by this history? There is so much that we never knew or understood. And we need to ask, why not? Why was this not part of our education of what we learned? It's been said that history is written by the victors and that would certainly seem to apply when it comes to the history we've been studying these past six weeks. We are isolated from one another. It is probably the most profound legacy of segregation, especially that in housing where today there are so few neighborhoods that are meaningfully integrated in any significant way. And so if we don't know one another as neighbors, um, it creates some barriers and stereotypes flourish. Something has to fill the gap. And, and so these stereotypes have been intensified by the media. I took a class at DuPont in the 1970s, late 1970s called Developing Effective Black-White Relationships. And it was targeted at a group of about 15 white managers and supervisors. It was also attended by two black employees, DuPont employees from two plant sites in the South. And the facilitators who were two African-Americans from San Francisco said that the reason that the black employees were there was that their, the facilitators were going to describe to us certain circumstances and situations that existed in corporate America and that we white managers were likely to say yes, but not at DuPont. And so the purpose of the black DuPont employees was whenever appropriate to speak up and say, oh yes, indeed. At DuPont. And as the class went on, one of the people, the men, one of the men from the plant, let us know that the local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan held its monthly meetings 
in the conference room at the plant at the invitation of the plant manager. Yes, at DuPont. Our facilitator said in setting the groundwork for all of this, there is room or opportunity for guilt and defensiveness and blame. And we want to try to just set that aside as much as we can by explaining that you cannot have grown up as a white person or even as a black person in the 20th century in the United States and not be prejudiced. You have, we have been overwhelmed with overt and covert subliminal messaging about the relative inferiority of black people. And that has created in us an implicit bias. And by implicit, it means something that we are often not conscious of. In this class, they began by asking the white participants, tell us all the words that you think of, adjectives that describe black people. And there was silence. And eventually someone spoke up and said, exotic. We wrote it on a chart pad. And then someone else said, athletic. And the third person said, um, musical. And the facilitator said, oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We gave um, inaccurate instructions. We don't want to know what you think. We want to know what you've heard. We filled 11 chart pad sheets with the most pejorative terms that you can imagine, sprinkled here and there with exotic, athletic, musical but 11 chart pad pages and they hung them around the room as we continued. And I sat there looking at those pages and those words and thought, what must it be like to leave your home every day knowing that most of the people you encounter as you navigate the white world hold those thoughts about you without even knowing you. What, what, what must that burden be like? There, um, it, all of this separation and segregation leads to a lack of understanding of one another, of empathy for the other circumstance, for what is it like to be black in America? And I have a friend um, who there are days he can't bring himself to leave the house. He's 78 years old, college educated, wonderful man. But the experiences that, that he encounters, some days he has the stamina to deal with it. And some days he just does not. He never leaves the house wearing a hooded sweatshirt. He never leaves the house casually dressed ever. So how does this affect us? It requires that each of us take some personal responsibility for action. So what's next? Well, as Christians, it is useful for us always to turn to prayer and to seek God's help as we navigate our way through the future. And then turn to self-examination. Um, Many of these classes are well integrated in terms of black and white participants. And, and so some of what we'll be talking about in the next few minutes are really specifically more directed to we white, to us white people who are here. We need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's okay. In fact, it is necessary that we are uncomfortable. It's what's required for growth. And so this process of self-examination is not easy. It requires that we look at our attitudes, at our behaviors, at our reactions in different circumstances. And important to the process is additional education and dialogue, sharing our thoughts, our questions, our knowledge, 
and listening to one another, listening to understand, not necessarily to respond. In terms of action, we need to consider what it is that needs to be done. And then what can I do? And what am I passionate about doing? And then I'll make a personal commitment, what I will do. So in the context of this self-examination, there is observing ourselves in situations and circumstances where for whatever reason, race is a factor. Reflecting on our thoughts, on our feelings, on the words that we speak, on the things that we do. And then monitoring our reactions. I'm not sure if I've shared with you in an earlier class, but a couple of years ago, a tree fell on our house and it did significant damage to our roof. We got everything sorted out with the insurance company and the roofer because we had, after all, just put a brand new roof on the whole house five months earlier. Timing is everything, but at least they could match the shingles. So the company came out to remove the tree and that caused a great deal of concern because of the way it had intertwined itself with different parts of the house. There was concern that the damage in removing it might be even greater than the damage that occurred when this 90 foot tall pine tree fell. So I was very apprehensive. I was sitting in the living room and suddenly I heard this loud crash and boom. And I looked up and I looked out the window and I saw that the crew chief was white and I felt better. And I immediately thought to myself, Sue, you know, you've done all this work you know, all these facts, you know, all of the circumstances, and yet your automatic response was feeling better about having a white man in charge. So it's not about scrubbing away those feelings, it's, and reactions, they are embedded in us. It is what do we do when they surface? And do we recognize them for what we are, what they are? And, and how do we deal with them? So being self-aware in all of this becomes essential so that we can reshape our responses. And in work like this, it's really helpful to engage a partner. A, for white people, a partner of color is ideal, but it's asking a lot. And many of us don't have the wherewithal to do that. So, engaging a partner, someone that we trust to tell us the truth, to give us the feedback that we need to hear that says, you know, you might want to rethink what you just said, or perhaps there's another way to respond. In terms of education, there are myriad books, videos, articles, museums, if you have not been to the African American History Museum in Washington, DC, I strongly recommend that as soon as the pandemic allows us to visit museums that you go there. It is three stories beginning at the bottom, working its way up to the history of African Americans in this country beginning in Africa. And it's powerful. And then there are classes like these and discussion groups that are either there already or that we can form. Just briefly, because there are a zillion, some recommended books. Um, and in my last class uh, afterwards, we sent an email with these listed, so you don't need to scroll them down. But America's Original Sin by Jim Wallace was the first one I started with. It gave a perspective on slavery as America's Original Sin. Between the World and Me by ta Coates is an essay he wrote to his adolescent son about what it is to be a black man in America and his counsel to his beloved son. Carol Anderson is a professor at Emory University. She is a dynamic speaker. If you ever have an opportunity to watch one of her videos, I recommend that you do. But she has written two books, White Rage, which describes the white backlash that historically occurs anytime there is any meaningful progress made 
for African Americans in our society. And she traces it over history and shows it again and again and again. And then her more recent book in 2018 called One Person No Vote that describes much of the voter suppression activities that began with the Supreme Court decision of Shelby v. Holder. And she didn't even get to 2020. The Fire Next Time and other books by James Baldwin from back in the 60s are powerful reflections from a black man, a, a, um, an eloquent um, and insightful author. The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander describes in exquisite detail our mass incarceration system and the consequences for our society. Just Mercy is the book by Brian Stevenson on his work with people unjustly convicted and sentenced to death um, in our prisons and the work that his organization has done to free them. The Warmth of Other Sons and Cast are two books by Isabel Wilkerson, one on the Great Migration and the other on the hierarchical structure of American society and how our caste system disadvantages all of us. And most recently, a new book by Heather McGee called The Sum of Us, where she uh, proposes that everything in our society is not a zero sum game. If a black person gets something, it doesn't mean that a white person has to lose something. That there are many things that have happened in our country, often directed at disadvantaging black people that end up harming white people as well and that there are ways for us to take actions that benefit everyone in our society. I'm a third of the way through it, reading it as fast as I can. It is a wonderful book. Some videos, Race, the Power of an Illusion is a PBS documentary that describes the fact that there is no genetic racial distinction um, that exists person to person. Um, so it's the science that says race is a social construct, is not a biological um, event. Robin D'Angelo is a great speaker uh, who has done a lot of work on deconstructing white privilege. And she has written the book, White Fragility, that you may have heard of. If you Google talks to help you understand racism in America, 25 TED Talks pop up, each by a different speaker and all very relevant to the topic. Emmanuel Acho is a former Philadelphia Eagle um, who developed a series of videos called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. I understand he has turned that into a book. I have not read the book, but the videos themselves, I believe there are 11 of them, 11 or 12. And they're about 10 minutes. One of them is a little bit longer but um, they are very open and frank and to the point and instructive. And, and I commend those to you. 13th is a documentary by Ava DuVernay that traces the consequences after the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment. Good Trouble by John Lewis uh, recently came to more attention as a consequence um, of the retrospective of his life that resulted from his death last year. Just Mercy is the movie with Michael B. Jordan based on Brian Stevenson's book. And then more recently, a video, I think it might have been distributed to you, if not, uh, we will, called Unpacking Racial Microaggressions. Alma Scott is a Wilmingtonian resident of the Highlands. And, um, she has lived in affluent liberal white communities for much of her life. And she describes her experiences living in these atmospheres and the dialogue is specifically over her last three years living in the Highlands. And it is a powerful insight into what it is to be black in white society, even if you are educated, intelligent, wealthy. It doesn't stop the stereotypes. Some articles, the history of the idea of race, again, that it is not a biological fact, but a social construct. Books that are uh, continually being, uh, articles continually being published by the Equal Justice Initiative. These four in particular, I have used 
for information on this class series. Uh, they contain a wealth of, of, uh, of information and the Equal Justice Initiative is continuing to publish more. And then in April 2014 in the Atlantic, Ta-Nehisi Coates published an article called The Case for Reparations. And I commend it to you. It's a long article, but he puts forth both why he believes reparations for African-Americans are needed uh, and how they might be constructed in a way to be meaningful and effective. So I believe there'll be more conversations about reparations going forward. I know this, the town of Evanston, Illinois has just instituted uh, a limited reparations policy associated with real estate. And I suspect we'll be hearing more about the topic going forward. And this article gives us all a really good grounding for that dialogue. Speaking of which, there are discussion groups that exist that can be formed, book groups, again, um, that we can join, that we can form, or even suggest one of these books for a book group that you currently participate with. Seek to develop cross-racial relationships, and then listen for understanding, and speak up when it is helpful and appropriate for our voices to be heard, especially when people were with express racist comments. And I know many of us are uncomfortable in knowing just how to do that. It's one of those things, uh, there's a situation, someone says something and you're kind of taken aback and then the conversation moves on. And later you say, oh, shoot, I could have had a V8. I should have said this, or I should have said that, or I should have said the other thing. So. My boss, at, one of my bosses at DuPont used to say, think it through out of the heat of battle. If you know that there are people that you are with who tend to say things that you don't agree with or that you believe are racist, practice ahead of time. And it could be as simple as, that's not my experience, or um, I don't agree. Actually, and provide a fact, or I used to think that, but I learned, or I read or saw, and I really found it helpful, ways to facilitate conversation, but make clear that silence is not assent, that being silent lets it go. Silence means okay with me, and it's important that if it's not okay, that we say something. In terms of real action for policy, because I've heard a number of speakers here lately say, you know, protests are powerful and meaningful, but it is time to add policy to these protests. We need to make change. So choose an issue that matters to you. Mine happens to be the criminal justice system and returning citizens, but for each of us, there is some aspect that speaks more uh, strongly to our hearts and our spirits. So figure out what that issue is and then find an advocacy group working on it where white and black people work together in partnership. In some of these organizations, they may be black led and whites follow. Some of those in Delaware include these uh, and there are more and in Pennsylvania, uh, there are more. Um, you can uh, sign on for newsletters. I know a lot of us get a gazillion emails and may feel like we don't need any more, but if there is an issue or a topic that matters, then being on the distribution list so that we know when it would be helpful to contact legislators, when it would be helpful to write letters, when it would be helpful to come and join a group event. Um, you don't have to sign up for them all, but pick one and then follow up. Seek opportunities to work together and make our voices heard. We also can look at something called personal reparations. We can patronize black owned businesses. Um, there is a long list from a website in Wilmington of it might be a couple hundred black owned businesses that we can patronize. There are companies in our community that make it a point to hire 
returning citizens, those people who have been imprisoned and are finding it difficult to get jobs and housing and restore a meaningful life. So Horizon Services, Second Chances Farm, look them up. There are a number of them and make sure that when you patronize them, you say, I am doing this. I chose you because of the work that you are doing to help people who've been incarcerated return to a productive life. And then contribute to and volunteer with Black-led organizations in the community. So what got me off the couch? In 2012, can't believe it was that long ago, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice was 12, Alton Sterling, Stefan Clark, Botham Jean, Laquan McDonald, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, Antoine Rose, Eric Garner, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Brianna Taylor, more recently Casey Goodson, Andre Hill, and hundreds if not thousands more who just like our long ago history are absorbing the violence committed against them, violence committed with impunity. It can't continue. So in closing, um, I don't know if you've heard of Eddie Gloud. He is the head of the African American Studies um, program at Princeton University, and he's an author uh, and, a, and a dynamic speaker. Um, I always try to find where he's speaking and listen. Um, that get comfortable being uncomfortable. I go looking for discomfort, um, but his messages are powerful. And his most recent book is predicated on the writings of James Baldwin. And so he was relating in a recent um, interview that he said, um, what used to make Jimmy so mad, so angry was the question that he would get. So what does a Negro want? He hated getting that question from white people. And he would respond by saying, what do you want? You want fairness, you want justice, you want opportunity, you want safety. That's what the Negro wants. So we're asking today, what is your conception of justice? Do we believe that some people should be valued more than others simply because of the color of their skin. Black people in our country are dying because of racism. The violence such as that described against that list of that abbreviated list of people. But also police actions, arrest rates, and health inequity, the food deserts, poverty, the poor nutrition, lack of access to health care, stress-related comorbidities, maternal and infant mortality, reduced life expectancy, is that justice? In October of 2018, the Census Bureau created a comprehensive census tract level data set that covered nearly the entire United States population. Life expectancy is a fundamental indicator of inequality. Researchers focus on life expectancy as the broadest possible dimension of privilege. The life expectancy for children born in Centerville, Delaware, 
exceeds those born in Wilmington near East 12th Street by 18 years, nearly two decades. These census tracts are less than six miles apart. And indeed, as we are seeing with greater clarity, our country itself is actually at risk because of racism. Racism doesn't just harm the targets. It harms us all and it is harming the structure and the foundation of our democracy. And so what do we need to do? We are called to fight for justice. So um, if you have questions or um, would like to contribute in any way, then just go ahead and raise your hand. Karen Weber, I, I see you there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sue, for all those positive things that we can do. I've really appreciated that because I know uh, I do feel very uncomfortable and it, it's good to um, find positive ways to try to uh, work through that. I do want to mention um, that my daughter Joy recommended a book um, that I'd like to pass on. I've gotten it out of the library called The War for Kindness um, by Jamil Zaki, who teaches at Stanford, I think. Uh, Building Empathy in a Fractured World. And I've just started it, but she is... Um, she works in a union. She's a union member up in New York City in the film industry. And so she has contact with a lot of people that are, you know, not liberal <laughs> somewhat. But, um, and she said the important thing for her to, and that she kind of passes on to me this advice too is listening and to, to just be open. You know, she said she knows that some of the people that she works with, I mean, they're people, you know, they, they have families, they, and we all have our prejudices, um, but she, you know, tries to listen mostly. So I just like to recommend, you know, this book along with our many other resources, but um, thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'm not familiar with that book. I will add it to my list. Yes, it was 2019, 2019. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, any others? Yeah, Rod, I see you. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this question, actually this question might be a bit more pastoral um, because as I've been reading books over the last year, um, the thing that has really been uh, troubling me more and more is, uh, as uh, Sue alluded, what we didn't learn in school. And I feel a, an increasing sense of betrayal by my community, my church, my school, and my family, because here I am, you know, middle of adulthood, never having learned any of this, and just seeing how much harm it's been doing my whole life long. And uh, so I almost feel like I'm getting paralyzed in my church because it's just not spoken, it, at least the church where I go. Um, and a lot of the churches I've been involved with, this is not a, uh, a topic. So for per me personally, I feel almost uh, paralyzed by that um, because it, it's a conversation that we need to get, get started in church, but it seems, you know, that, um, you know, the, Robert P. Jones book, um, White Too Long about the white church, you know, how he describes uh, how the church actually, if you're, if you're involved in a church and if you are active in a church, 
you're actually more likely to hold racist um, attitudes than if you're uh, religiously unaffiliated. And I found that really confusing and, uh, but, but certainly true to, to my experience. So how do we move forward in our church? How do we, one, continue to love our neighbor and ex, you know, accept all people when there seems to be a real entrenchment of, of denial, I guess? Yeah, Sue, did you have any thoughts? I'm gonna leave that to the pastors. <laughs> I mean, there are some other pastors here. So if you guys want to weigh in too, I mean, I, I would say that from, from my perspective, Rod, as, as a pastor, um, the very first thing is the one statistic you kind of threw out just about if you're involved in a church, you're more likely to be racist. I, I, would, I would wonder, my very first question is, I wonder what kinds of churches they polled. And hang on, I got more to say about that. Because... Um, <laughs> I think if you, I think if, I think that is really true, particularly if you poll randomly through the country with most people in the country attending kind of Baptist and evangelical churches and non-denominational. I think that, I think those numbers begin to skew the church. With that said, um, I also think that in our mainline Protestant congregations, and probably Roman Catholic as well, um, similarly situated, particularly in this region of the country. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see it among, among members. It, it is really hard and it's disheartening. And I think as a pastor, I think one of the, the things that I try to constantly remember myself is that I don't know that I realized that this was such a deeply embedded problem myself. And, you know, in my tradition, um, we do confession and forgiveness right out of the box. And I take it way seriously uh, because um, I think it's the foundation of where we have to start um, is by owning that. And I know that um, for those of us on this call that are part of our anti-racism group, that's where we had this, that's, and we're still there. We're, we're just starting our work this year. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a drive to want to go and to want to do, and, you know, it's like, okay, well, we can go and we can do, but we have to understand that there are people that haven't yet quite embraced this idea of, um, of what racism really is. Because I, I just thought all along, well, okay, yeah, racism is a problem. There's a lot of um, uh, white uh, supremacy uh, that's starting to creep in. But we see that, we get that. Because it's the people who, you know, overtly are racist. I was stunned reading um, Ibram X. Kendi's book, um, Anti-Racism how to become an anti-racist because he redefined racism in a different way, in a way that as a Lutheran myself, I can get on board with. Because if I can get on board with the notion that um, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that we're in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves, I, I think that jives right along with his concept of all of us being racist. Um, because we're all part of this system um, uh, that is set up in America. And, and whether we want to change it or not, we function within a system that is inherently racist. And we've got to, first, we've got to acknowledge that and understand it. it. It's hard for people to even grasp the fact that, you know, even our capitalist system itself is sinful. I, you know, as, as much as, you know, communism is bad and everything, I, I think it's one of those things that, you know, capitalism is the worst, is the worst economic system on the planet, except for all the others. Everything else. It's, it's still, it's still terrible. 
um, and it still leaves people behind. And it's it it's driven by greed, and it it functions the same way as racism for me. I, I think churches are are just now coming to realize and reckon with the fact that um, that racism is is a is our is our problem. And, and I don't know that I ever viewed it that way. And I've been a pastor now for almost 20 years. And while I knew racism was an issue out there, um, I don't know that I saw it as an urgent issue for our church until the last maybe 18 months. And you know, Sue, Sue put up that slide of what got her moving and it was the names. I, I I sadly confess it wasn't the names that got me up and moving. It was President Trump standing in front of St. John's Church with that Bible in the midst of having shot rubber bullets at the protesters. That I said, this is this is power co-opting my Christ to subjugate black people in America. And I was horrified by it. I was horrified by it and began to really be moved then, Sue, by all of those names that are out there because I became aware of them. So, um, I, so I mean, just from my perspective and I, I, any other pastors, I see Sue's got her hand up, so I, I don't want to necessarily skip over people, but I mean, Sue, if you were going to kind of contribute in there, I'd invite you and Wes Hamlin and others um, I don't know who, who all I kind of see in there, um, but um, but kind of invite those folks to to kind of kind of weigh in as well. I, I, I think to some degree we've got to give the church the time, but we also need our leaders to step up and do something, and say something, and and be more than what we've been. Uh, that's my confession, Rod. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Sue, did you have anything to add to that? I did. So um, many of the people Zooming today will remember that I was an intern at St. Philip's. Um, my internship year was marked by the death of Michael Brown at the beginning. And I think Freddie Gray was later that year. So racism has informed my sense of what it is to be a pastor in the um, you know, modern day Lutheran church. Um, I, I was thinking first about surveys that show that those who are regular church attenders um, tend to express more racist ideas or however that was formulated. And what I wonder if that also tracks with what every one of us can observe that um, younger families and our high school and college students are moving away from church. And I wonder if those two ideas are correlated. The, the mainline Protestant church has maybe not done as good of a job as speaking out against the systemic evils that we witness, um, especially racism. And I don't think that works anymore for our, our college and high school age kids. So it could be the church's silence. Um, the mainline Protestant church's silence is beginning to bite us in the butt now. Um, another idea, uh, it's hard to stand in the pulpit and say things that you know are gonna make people angry. So when your pastor, who, wherever you go to church, when your pastor tackles these subjects, you could bet a million dollars that on Monday morning, they're gonna hear from angry people who are disgusted by politics in the pulpit. So if you're someone like Rod who longs to hear these anti-racism messages proclaimed as gospel truth, then support your pastor and let them know that they're not standing up there by themselves, but that you also um, that you also long to hear that message. And my last idea, the Ibram Kendi book, I thought was powerful. Um, he he makes a distinction between saying that people are racist, which I think he would not say, and saying that actions or um, ideas or words can be racist. And to me, that goes right to the heart of the Lutheran idea that we're all saints and sinners simultaneously. In a one you know, expression out of my mouth, I could say something horribly racist, 
But in the next moment, I could say something anti-racist and being aware of the difference between those two is where our you know, path to a better way of forming community lies. That is it, that's my three thoughts. Patrick, I... Carol, I saw you were next. You, your hand went down, but I don't know if that just got hit. Are you, are you, did you wanna well, say something? <laughs> I'm so exhausted by all of this, I guess, you know, you just, and I guess um, I did have one question and then I did have a comment. And uh, Sue, you had mentioned um, in closing, that in closing slide where you referenced um, what does the Negro want, but you mentioned someone, some contemporary who you said was a very good speaker and whenever he spoke, you made sure you, you got to hear him. And I didn't hear the name. His name is Eddie Gloud, G-L-A-U-D-E, and he is the head of the African American Studies um, at Princeton University. Oh, at Princeton, uh, okay. Yeah. And he frequently appears on MSNBC and NBC programs and, and others, and he's also had a number of um, interviews and podcasts sponsored by a series of organizations focused on addressing racism. Okay. Thank so you. If you Google his name, you'll find probably ample opportunities to listen to him. Okay, and, and not that, that you haven't all heard enough um, uh, recommendations, but there is another series called um, uh, Seeing White, and it's a podcast through um, something radio. Um, seen on radio, S E E N E on radio.org. And um, it's actually a quite good one. I um, mean, it actually comes with um, both transcript, written, and uh, a study guide. So, anybody who might like to delve into that, um, one of the organizations that I share with Gigi. Miller, which is the reason that I found out about this class, is that um, we are engaging in that courageous conversation and uh, using that as our um, our jumping board for conversation and discussion. Um, and and so you know, moving forward, and why I said you know I'm listening and it's exhausting. Um, you know, I feel as though um, at one level, one aspect of my life, I was very much emerged in a black American community because of where I was teaching. And, you know, I moved to Chester County, Pennsylvania, and, you know, we were in the Unionville School District. And I don't, I don't know many black people anymore because of where I live. And so it's very difficult and I do have one or two um, black friends um, but you know they're more colleagues than friends I mean we're friendly and we like each other but you know our lives are busy we don't really go to tea together whatever um, and so you know I know that one of the things you had on your slide had to do with you know trying to engage um, and I, I'm always struck with and I pose this to someone else and um, how to not come across as being insincere or not genuine in when you make, uh, you know, a, a reach out to someone who is of color and, you know, how, how I worry about that. I worry about coming across wrong and because it can come across that way because I'm white. <laughs> and so um, I'm just throwing that out there if other people have some comments to make or suggestions on how to, I don't know, do the right thing. Well, when I said uh, we're gonna be uncomfortable and we need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, um, you know, we may make some mistakes, um, but I think leading with, you know, here I am at whatever point in my life and I've sort of been unconscious when it comes to the, this circumstance and these issues. And I'm in the process of learning a lot 
Um, and most significant, what I'm learning is what it is that I still don't know. Um, and, and I really am seeking to better understand and to be able to help facilitate meaningful change. Um, and I know a big part of it remains the change in me. And I'm wondering if we could get together for coffee sometime and just talk about how things are, what, what is. Um, and, and I think in being sincere in taking the initiative and then listening to what is said. Um, in, in the class like this that, that I did with St. Andrew and Matthew, one of the African-American women in the group said, you need to understand, you think you're exhausted? Um, I could tell you what exhaustion is. So courage, Camille. Um, but what is hardest for me as a black woman in reliving the pain of sharing my experience is when the listener discounts it or says, oh, you must have misunderstood or really that that pushback, that lack of willingness to absorb and accept is one of the most painful things. Because if I'm going to lay myself out there and tell you the kinds of things that people say to me and do to me that are so hurtful, and I'm gonna take the risk of sharing that with you so that you will better understand and what I get back is, I'm wrong. I'm not going to have this conversation anymore. Right. Not going to do it. And and so the only final thing is is the gross injustice and systemic racism. And of course, being a person of action, um, like I like to do things. So sitting through a class is great. You're, oh my gosh. It was like every Sunday, nope, this is where, where I'm gonna be on Sunday. Um, how, I mean, I can do things on a personal level. Okay, so that I, cause I can control that, all right? That's me making a step. But on the bigger issue, what once, what would be the best step that we could do to affect real change, like changing the laws. I mean, other than voting, is there something, I know you flashed those organizations. Is there one better than another to get involved with? I mean, I've just been doing a lot of stuff with the museum in um, Washington, DC. And, and that's been amazing because they have so many programs, uh, especially now online, that uh, the National Museum of um, African American Museum of History and Culture. Um, but you know, for change, like real change, laws change. Well, I, I think there are organizations that focus in different areas. Um, Network Delaware, for those who live in Delaware, is an interesting one because it gathers together the work being done by a variety of organizations. And so uh, I think every week they have an action list. Um, and this is the week to contact your representative about this bill or that bill or whatever. And so uh, there's a clear set of this week, here are the things that you can do. But voting is important, but that's every two years or every four years. But bills are being considered in the legislature every single day that they're in session. And so educating ourselves about what those are, what they seek to accomplish, and then contacting state and federal legislators with support or opposition is important and you may say, well, yeah, but I'm just one person. But to the extent to which we do that when we haven't done it before, legislators do pay attention when the public that puts them in office says, we strongly support this or we strongly oppose that. You'll see lots of uh, letters circulating as you get engaged with some of these organizations. Please send this letter uh, in support of HB 37. 
and there'll be a text there for the letter. And all you have to do is add your name and your email address and your zip code. But, but what is really important is to insert a first sentence or paragraph. That is your view, because that's more powerful than um, a legislator receiving the identical message where all people had to do was click send. Put your piece in there. That will get their attention. Why does this matter to me? I know you live in Pennsylvania, Delaware being a smaller state. We have heard over and over again that so much just happens in the legislature and, and the people who are involved in creating and passing those laws seldom, if ever, hear from their constituents. 20 people is a lot to hear from on a bill. And so if suddenly they're hearing from 200 or 300 or 500 people, that will get their attention. And so don't just send it yourself, share that with friends, neighbors, fellow congregants, whatever, and say, uh, add your comment, send this in, this can make a difference. It doesn't seem like much, um, but, it, but it can be. And I just wanna go back to the Ibram Kendi, racist, non-racist, anti-racist. Um, one of the things I believe is it does no good to toss that term around, that racist term, to say you're a racist, he's a racist, she's a racist. It sets up defensive mechanisms. It's a label, it's a label like so many others. And there are nuances and issues and elements. So I personally don't see any value in utilizing it in that way. But I think that concept of non-racist is really important because it covers most of us. And I would put that, that collection of pastors um, who are human being Americans who grew up with the same history lessons that the rest of us grew up with. Um, there's nothing that says a pastor should have known this history earlier than any of the rest of us had the opportunity uh, to, to do that. But as, as non-racists, we're kind of gliding along the surface. We are benefiting, we white people, of whatever our role in society from this system that advantages white people. And dialogue about privilege can be difficult, but it's an essential understanding to have to say, I'm not privileged. Well, yeah, actually you are. And, and if you wanna just start with, um, there are people who say to me, I, you know, I just, I, I, don't, I don't need to deal with this. I don't wanna deal with it. Well, that's a privilege. If you don't wanna deal with race and you're white, you got it. If you're black, you have no choice. Um, you do, you have to deal with it. And I think looking at the world in which we live and saying, where do I benefit? Where do I benefit from being white? Are uh, there are books to read, there are discussions to have um, that, I, that I think are very useful as part of that self-examination uh, and the introspection that I talked about. Um, so it's just, a, it's, it's another aspect of, of work that's needed. I, I said in, in the um, voter suppression class with the church last week, I said, you know, all of this, all of this history, all this stuff's been going on under the radar, right? Because we didn't know about it. And a person in the chat class <laughs> responded, no, it hasn't. No, it hasn't been going on under the radar. Every black person in America can tell you what's been happening. And every white person seeking to implement these laws and these penalties and these circumstances are very clear about what they're doing and why. So that the people for whom this has been under the radar are people like us. And once it's on our radar, which it is to one degree or another for all of us, then it becomes a question of, so what do we do to counter it? But this has not been done under the radar. 
We've got Elizabeth and then Lee. I saw you trying to get our attention. So Elizabeth and then Lee. Don't forget to take yourself off. There you I go. Did. I just did. Um, I just wanted to mention, and I, I don't know, I, I just came in right at one o'clock. The Newcastle County Libraries is disseminating the Equal Justice Initiative 19, uh, 2021 calendar. Yep. that I passed out to some folks like pastors and, and outreach and this at, at my church. Um, you had to sign up sort of like a book clubby kind of, you know, they sent out an email. So if anybody's interested every single day, it has, you know, a little historical thing. It's very educational and um, there's lots of information there. It's not just, you know, African-Americans, indigenous people, this, that, but I just did want to mention that. It's a great calendar and um, you can actually get copies. We have copies on the literature table uh, at Westminster where I go to church. I just, I've got 30 copies from the, from the library there um, in Wilmington and then put a notice in the, the weekly bulletin that they're available. But they, they're, they're, you know, it's just a little block on a monthly calendar with an event that has occurred at some point in the past. So it's a a great way of just little bits of information every single day. Thank you for raising that, Elizabeth. Yeah. Lee, you I saw you trying to get our attention. Yeah, I was, I was just a couple points. I mean, I saw a lot of racism growing up in the 60s as a teenager and a young person. And I've worked for a couple of people who were outwardly racist and I was going to school like on the cusp of, of DSEC and one of the weirdest experiences I had was in 68 I was going finishing up my associate's degree at Goldie when I was downtown and it was back this time that Martin Luther King was assassinated. And it was waiting for the bus at Rodney Square. And you had, you must have been 300 young black people walking 10 across down Market Street, singing, we shall overcome. In that experience, kind of really have stuck to me for the last 50, 55 years. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Lee. Thank you for sharing that, Lee. Any other, uh, yeah, I see Marvin, there you are, Marvin, just unmute yourself. Um, one thing that I got out of this class that, uh, I found very interesting and that was no matter what amendment or law we put in on a national basis to try to help with the problem of racism, it seems like we're so good at finding a workaround so fast uh, so that uh, the minority group, whether it's our Black American brothers or uh, other minority groups are kept in their place. And uh, I felt like I really became aware of that because of this class. I think you're right, Marvin. Some of these uh, circumstances, situations are reinforced by state and local ordinances and things, but there's still people's attitudes. I think at the federal level, probably the law that's had the greatest impact was the Voting Rights Act. But of course, not anymore, not unless Congress passes the John R. Lewis, because it, it required action in advance. Um, Everything else is, okay, fine, that's the law, but we're gonna do something else and catch us if you can. Um, so uh, a lot of it has to do with these kinds of conversations, engaging people um, 
who, if they knew more, would do more. Um, I think. I think. I think also, and, and I didn't really highlight this in uh, in talking earlier. I think taking advantage of those opportunities for conversation with with neighbors, with friends, with families, recognizing that you know it's not about giving a speech, but just a willingness to talk about what's going on and um, share learnings and experiences and make it okay to talk about, um, I think is a helpful individual thing to do as well. Ultimately, you're right. Um, we're very creative at getting around things that we don't like. Um, but there does this, this to me, this, I lived through the civil rights movement in that I was in college, 63 to 67, which I sort of considered the height of the civil rights movement, having grown up in this all white community in Wilmington, Delaware. But this period of time feels different than the previous 50 years, 40 years. It feels like an opportunity and we won't fix it. We'll never fix it all. But we can we can take baby steps. We can make changes. We can we can change. We can moderate the arc of justice. You know, we can bend it a little more. Now, um, the opportunity is there. I see Phil and Mary. Okay, um, last spring. Um, I had the chance to attend the virtually that Peace Week Delaware. It sort of an ad came along and I, a couple of things I, I took away from that. One was I heard about the Second Chances Farm, which um, someone mentioned today. And I would really commend that to people. Uh, you know, just to look into it, um, it's a, uh, we, you know, every week we get a, a delivery of microgreens to our door here in Kennett Square. And, uh, we certainly learned to eat a lot of green, but um, it, it's a, a, an uh, donation uh, in part, you know, we certainly get something from that, but um, it's a way to support um, returning citizens. And um, also on, there was another program that, uh, that same Peace Week um, uh, called Sisters. And this was um, Christian women, uh, Muslim women and Jewish women who would get together and just, share social, you know, socially experience and, and they invited each other, you know, just as friends and, and they learned about their commonalities and their differences and, and ability to celebrate those. And, and there's nothing to say that the same thing couldn't happen across races um, where we would share walks or, or um, of course they'd had to go virtual for, COVID too, but um, you know, whether they got together for a meal, it, it was, there was no real agenda, but just to be part of each other's lives and, and understand and listen. And, and it, it was sounded like a incredibly challenging, but also very enriching kind of um, thing to do. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Yeah. I don't see any other hands. I'm just gonna flip through here, see if anybody's got their hand waving at me. Oh, I see John. Go ahead, John. John Lyon. Hey, buddy. You gotta take yourself off mute there, John. Yep, there you go. There I'm you go, friend. I'm good. I just wanna thank you, Sue, for uh, this uh, presentation. It's been, it's been wonderful for us to be able to understand a little bit more that all the things that I did not know um, the one comment there about how racism, racism can destroy the community or can destroy uh, much of what we have today. There's also the positive side of that, that now that things are, as you said, you know, maybe edging to another direction. And then we can see that there's a, a way for us to be able to make some changes and make them to, to benefit not only for all races it doesn't matter you know all of us are the same you know we're you know as you said we all have the same dna and what's the difference i i've always felt that way even as a kid but i i didn't realize all the things that were going on in in the world you know uh, that that caused this kind of uh, disruption 
um, especially with some of the other countries and what they do, they just massacre some people that they don't like. So I, I just appreciate what you've, uh, what, what you've done here and it's been very, very informative for me. Thank you. Thank you, John. You know, just one comment about that, the book, uh, The Sum of Us by Heather McGee, she starts with the issue of municipal pools back in the 50s and 60s. There was no air conditioning, there were no backyard pools. And so if you were gonna cool off in the summer, all these cities had pools that you could go swim in. And in city after city and town after town, as the law changed and uh, these pools were required to let African-Americans swim, they drained the pools, they filled the pools with cement, um, they closed the parks so that nobody got to swim um, in, in an attempt to, to keep Blacks from experiencing the, um, the opportunity or to keep from the races mixing. They denied, they denied the good to everyone. And, and her whole point is why can't we have nice things? Well, we can if we start realizing that this is not all a zero sum game, that there are things that can be done that benefit everyone. And, and it's not if you gain something, I have to lose something which tends to be um, a capitalist view, if you will, um, and to some degree, a human view. So thank you, John. I see Donna. You know, when you, when you talk about that, Sue, and how the I'm still with this. I read something to near and dear to my heart. And it was very hard for me to read it, knowing who posted it. It says, we are not all equal. I worked my ass off to get where I Donna, we're not, we're not, Donna, we are not getting, you're really breaking up on us. I deserve what I have. Yeah, Donna, we're not, we're not, we're not gonna, we're not picking you up here. We're, we're kind of missing. I apologize. Of what, of what I you're think saying. it's your internet connection, Donna. Yeah. Work. Yeah. We'll have to we'll have to maybe pick that up at another point there. Um, or send me an email. I'd I'd love to hear what you had to say, Donna. So uh, yeah. Would be cool. yeah. Sue at WPC.org. Thanks. If if you need it, Donna, I can get you Sue's email. So just shoot shoot me an email and remind me, okay, sweetheart. Okay. That, that and I can make sure I, get it. I don't know how to read the machine, but I have a comment. When I was growing up, uh, my family, the first house we lived in was in Collins Park over near, near Newcastle. It was the first community built after the war. And most of the people who bought there were like DuPont, Hercules, and Atlas employee families. And we, we moved out because the family was growing, as you know. We just, three bedrooms weren't gonna do it. And we moved out here. About a year or so after that, the first black family moved into the area. They blew them out. They literally blew the house down. And you gotta, gotta remember that was like 1958, 58. There was a lot of bad stuff going on there. Lee, 
uh, the, the father of my sister's best friend, Margot Levering, her father, Mr. Levering, sold the house to that Black family, um, sold the house to the first Black family in Collins Park. Uh, the Leverings lived on Marsh Road, just north of Carcroft, where I lived. And I remember driving by the house more than once with mobs of people on the front lawn burning crosses um, on Marsh Road because this real estate agent had dared to sell a house in Collins Park to a black family. So I remember that vividly. I was 12. Um, I remember that vividly. Any other, any other questions? Just kind of mindful of our time here. Okay. Sue, Gigi, is, Gigi, is there anything we need to close with? No, thank you again, everybody. And thank you, Sue. Thank you all. Yeah. Sue, thank, thank you, you Sue. Sue. Happy Easter. Happy Easter to all of you. Yeah. you too. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.